Skidampa Library's Chats with Champion program, and we are proud once again to present Calvin and Houston Dodge, and they're going to reminisce about life in Damascata, and specifically, Calvin has put together some uh, whole slide set that shows Damascata after the 1845 fire that burned most of downtown, and uh, the brick buildings were uh, were uh, built at that time, and so you'll see some familiar and some not familiar. I hear somebody with a hand behind their head because you can't, can you not hear? Oh, okay, all right, I thought somebody could, can you, can you all hear? We're trying to mic it so that it works on me. We're being videotaped too. Um, both men are local historians and distant relatives. Uh, everybody always asks, uh, yes, but quite a ways back. Um, and uh, they're going to, uh, both of them have been in uh, Damerscott and Newcastle for a long time. Um, Houston is uh, 97 now, he said, in June. And Calvin admitted to, I think it was 79, was it? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and Houston lives on Bristol Road, and that's in the house that he was born in. It was, the house was built in 1795, and uh, he is an expert on 18th century construction. And he is the last living employee of Wallace Nutting's Furniture Shop in Massachusetts. And uh, Houston worked for Nutting for a couple of years uh, just before uh, Wallace died and before the Second World War began. And uh, at that time, Houston was able to build several Nutting pieces himself. So he has a treasure trove of uh, things that have were, were built. And then Houston uh, went into the Army Air Corps during the war and served in England and Belgium and he took advantage of his spare time there and the available tools to build a number of pieces in the 18th century style. Um, he does pride himself in not moving toward the future rapidly and thoroughly enjoying <laughs> all of the wonderful old things, old methods, old tools. Um, and he has a uh, Houston, in this area, he collected, dismantled, and rebuilt 12 antique homes, barns, and other buildings. Calvin uh, grew up in Newcastle. Oh, and, uh, Houston also grad, uh, attended Lincoln Academy, so he is a local boy in that way, and then he uh, graduated from so the Gould Academy um, because they had a good shop program back then, and that certainly spoke to him. Calvin uh, grew up in Newcastle and graduated from Lincoln Academy, and he currently lectures uh, on history of the area. And as you probably know, he has he and his wife Marjorie in the second row here um, uh, run the um, the uh, antique shop, the Red Barn Antique Shop. Sorry, I'm not reading this, and I'm getting this uh, mixed up here. Um, and uh, Calvin. Uh, in the 1950s, after high school, he worked as a carpenter also on some of the buildings that Albert Bufort, a local architect and builder, had designed, including the Damascata Fire and Police Department, and the First National Bank, and the Noble Borough Central School. And then Calvin was a manager at BIW for 32 years and retired in 1990, uh, and he joined Marjorie at the Cooper's Red Barn Antiques on Main Street and that shop has been in business since 1942. And he is a founding member and a past president of the Damascata Historical Society. And he and Marjorie together have written over 328 articles for the Lincoln County News. And Calvin uh, will, is the, uh, will, will use some of the slides that we have and uh, talk, uh, Calvin will start us off talking about the fire of 18 45. Mary, just hit any key on the on the on the computer there. And also, please turn off your uh, cell phones. There you go. Um, thank, you. thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here today to share a history on Damascata. I'd like to bring your attention to a lot of the photographs, a lot of the younger people do not know what happened in Damascus. I keep writing some articles on Lincoln County News, and I like to bring back the old days of Damascus and uh, focus on the, the 
past history. So many of these photographs I have today taught a time period in life and that, uh, what was actually going on in Damascara. I'm going to give a little preliminary talk before we get to the slideshow. We'll go back to 1839, and Damascara then was part of Nobleboro and Bristol. And the town line was down what we call Hospital Creek. And uh, if you go down School Street, you'll still see the stone marker. And the town line was in Red Island High Street and Red Inn to Mill Creek, the bay, by the hospital. Dallas Carter still was what I call the hub of Lincoln County. It was a busy, busy place with merchants and shipbuilding. As we get into it, the merchants in town kept saying, we need fire protection. And of course, Damascara village at that time was, was on the south end of Noble Barrel. So not much attention was being paid to, to the buildings. The money was being made in the shipbuilding business from 18, 28 to 18, say, 45, there was a mass amount of money made and fortunes made here in Damascus by area merchants as well as shipbuilders, people who supplied the lumber, timber, and everything for the building of our town. In 1845, the town was 90% wooden buildings. And I just want a picture in your mind. If you look down the riverside, everything was wooden buildings extended out on walls with piling. And on the walls, they set all these sail makers' buildings, big buildings, where the sails were sold and made for all the ships that were being built here in Damascara. On the east side, looking up the river, was a large amount of wooden buildings. Was there a bridge then? That's from the bridge up to where the bookstore is today. There was all wooden buildings. Was there a bridge that went across the river then? Excuse me? Was there a bridge that went across the river? Oh yes, there were four bridges. Okay. Two, three wooden bridges, a steel bridge, and finally the concrete and cement bridge. The people and merchants in Damascara really cared for our town. They were dedicated people. They did everything they could to attract business. If you look back at some of the main history books, as well as the main books from out of the state, you will tell about the merchants of Damascara, the shipbuilders of Damascara, the brickyards of Damascara. So everything was booming. At that time in Damascara, the population of nearly 5,000 people. Now, 1845 came, and that was the year of the Great Fire. 70 percent of the wooden structures in Damascara were burned on Main Street. That included 33 wooden buildings. If you look back at some of the records, town records, some of the records that Errol Kastner wrote on Damascara history. So a total of 33 buildings on Main Street, which made up 70% of the merchants, uh, the sale lofts, the buildings, the hardware stores, and everything, all went up in flames. The fire lasted for nearly 24 hours. When it ended, there was nothing but burnt embers and piles of coal and ashes just simmering in the morning dew. The very next day or so, the merchants got together. The shipbuilding people got together. And history goes on to reveal, we're not going to let the town of Damascara die. We're going to rebuild. <coughs> Them days, they were wise. They said, we will not build a town of wooden buildings again. We will build a town of brick buildings. So this is what you see today on Main Street. It's all brick buildings except a few. And those people, 
decided they'd just go on wooden structure. Because that started a tremendous lot of work in 1846. The brickyards started to boom. The granite business around Lincoln County started to boom. Because these builders needed granite for the headers, doorways of the buildings and door steps. They needed brick to build the buildings. The sawmills were busy. They needed lumber for all these buildings for the roofs and everything. So we'll start right here, Mary. <coughs> this is the building here on Main Street on the east side. The first building was in the Thanawasta building. That building was built from money in the shipyard business. Samuel Austin had a house, two street, two houses down the block. He built tremendous ships. The next building was this building here. And that was a nice building. When I was a boy, this was Lincoln County Hardware. And this here was Wheeler's Radio Shop. And then we go to this building, and that was Rex Hall Pharmacy, Martin's Rex Hall Pharmacy. And uh, that was called the Henry Mellis Block. Then we go to the next block, and that was the Asa Snow Block. Asa Snow was a pharmacist. I have some of his models that date back in 1847-48. When I was a boy, that was Poland's drugstore. There were about five drugstores in a row in that building. <laughs> I remember going in the Pullman drug store with my mother and then back in the beach shop, yes. Which side is the east side? I'm new to Denver, Scott, so It's on this side of the top. You know. yeah. As you're looking out towards the Elm Street Plaza. Now the next building is a brick structure. That was the third brick block building. These buildings are built in 1846. And that building was known as the Robert Dixon building. And that's where R.H. Rennie is today. Yeah, the Dixon Hall. And when I was a boy, that was the A and B store. And I remember going in with my parents, you open the door, right for the front door, was the coffee grinder. Because everybody ground their coffee. Oh, the smell and the aroma of the coffee was great. So that was the A&P. That stood for Atlantic and Pacific Grocery Company. And, uh, okay, Mary, not well. You can slide ahead here. Yeah. Okay, there we go. That's the A&P, which is today is R.H. Rennie's first store. His number one store out of 16 today. <coughs> Upstairs was Glidden Insurance Agency. I used to go with my father up there. Mr. Glidden, Dad always called him John, would say, come in, have a seat, Marrow. So I sat on one of his settees that he had in the store. And of course, the third thing he'd do would be in a good salesman. He'd open up a box of cigars and pass my father a cigar. <laughs> because John would be puffing there on the cigar. The smoke would be filling that room right up. Dad would pay his insurance bill. He'd always say, yeah, have an extra cigar to take home, Harold. <laughs> a lot of memories stick with him right here. Now we go to the Chapman, the Chapman block. Now this gentleman here was in the ship building business. He owned ships. He owned, them days you could buy a 16th of a ship or a 32nd of a ship or 1 8th of a ship. These ships being built. So many of these ships built here in Damascola were partially owned by all these merchants. And now, this building is King Elvis Pub. Looking back, that was a garage. When I was a boy, they sold Kaiser Frazier cards. I don't think you people can remember Kaiser Frazier cards. I was run up a little more to Kaiser was one of the first men to build ships for the Navy which were well, they built them for the government. They were freighters. And he had a record of building one in less than two days. They pre panned them, put them together. They only expected the ships to make one voyage and supplies to England, and that would pay for the ship alone. There's a great history on shipbuilding. 
Now we come to the day block. This is a strange little building because on the end of it, right here, this is built in two pieces. One was here and the other here was the day block. And uh, that was Isaac Getner block. And then the day block. This is when the bank remodeled the bank. They put a nice stone and cement structure on the front. Took off the dolmens, which are up here on the top of the roof. And uh, that served up to the 1970s. Uh, Houston's father was president of the First National Bank of Damascus. And right here on this side was the Damascus Post Office when I was a boy. They did a good job when they did this, and uh, it was a nice looking building. Uh, when Mr. Freeman decided in the bank and moved to the new building, Rivercrest Association he formed, and he said, it's time to restore some of these buildings back to their natural structure and how they look. So they come up and borrowed a lot of our photographs of these old buildings. <coughs> And if you look today, you can see dolmens being put back on the roof. And now they're remodeling and doing stonework on the whole building, which needed it. When that building was first built, uh, that was built in the days in 1850. And the top floor was the sail wall. So all the sails for some of these ships today's built were made right there at the sail wall. Okay, ready. Now we're coming to the Lincoln Hall block. And this is a safe, which they brought over from Newcastle. And they had cut a hole in the side of the building. <laughs> and they're moving the safe off the old bus and buggy, big structural. And there's a set of boys there, and they're pulling the safe into the building. So that was one of the first locations of the First National Bank of Dallas Scholar. And notice. Oops, I just want to show I you. <laughs> right here, I'd love to know why this went. This is a drinking problem for the horses and oxen. And inside that building, there was a bubbling spring. The water from that spring came out and fed this little cast iron drinking problem for the horses. Okay. And as I understand it, uh, the Lincoln Theater and the library still have a water problem? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> now in the same building, when I was a boy, this was Casper's Hardware. And they had the most beautiful cast iron twisted supports right here. And then right here, I remember Mr. Ed Casper coming in, and he'd always tip his hat and he'd say, Good morning to the ladies. And then he, one of my uh, wife's first tricycles came from. Ed Casper's Highway. <laughs> so we had old time memories there. She had one of the pole cards that came from Ed Casper's Highway. Okay, next. Okay, this is Pierce's Yellow Front Grocery Show. Now, this all took place when I was a boy. They had this metal yellow front on the store. And uh, I used to go in there. This is yes, uh, everything. The meat was all pre-cut and, and in the counter. So it wasn't pre-wrapped. You'd know on something, he'd go out, cut your meat, and bring it out. Your hamburger was always freshly ground. And this was about 1950, because I had the first stocking meat I put in town. <laughs> I had one little pocket meters. I was always going to convert it into a map. But I never got there. <laughs> One day I got to slow down and do a few things I want to do. <laughs> oh, it was so much fun they put the yellow part. Everything was handled. You went up, you give them a grocery list, and they would go down, take the items off the shelf, put it on the counter, take a paper bag out, and write down each item on the paper bag, and then they'd add it all up. And he'd say so much. And now when you get home, he'd always say, add up the figures, a dozen degree will make the difference out. <laughs> and I often said, between the First National, A&P, and this, there was a lot of people that were good in addition. 
<laughs> Today, some of the younger children were lost by Eddie. They got to rely on that computer. And when that battery goes out in the computer, they're in little trouble. <laughs> The museum was American Express Office. That also was located in the day block at one time. Things moved on and they decided the railroad business should be up in the railroad station. So that's where American railroad business moved up the next to the post office. That's why they had the little warehouse. And I was there back in the 40s and 50s. Okay. Now we're going back to the Building here, and so this is where the main store, book store is today after it's been remodeled. And this is where the old library stood. It's still there today. And the new building where we stand today is the one next to it. I have a lot of fond members are going into the hall upstairs in the movie theater. I have a few people that still can remember when they had talking movies. They were silent movies, and uh, people used to come up and talk when the movies were being flashed on. They used to have vaudeville acts there at the old Lincoln Theater. They used to have dances. The main thing is, I remember that's where we held our graduation exercises when I graduated. And there used to be a gentleman by the name of George Jones. He lived to be a hundred. He used to lead us in with his violin. And uh, I was one of the fortunate ones to be led in our class. Your class, my dear, was led in, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we're going to take a walk. We're going to be up at the Baptist Church heading to the down street in the old cast iron bridge down to the end. <coughs> but here is what is now the Dallas Strata Service Center, which when I was a boy it was casting us. Oh, excuse me, I was a boy for the center's department store. And that was built, a beautiful building, and that was a W.W. W. Hilton building. There again, that was made for money from the shipbuilding business. I'm getting a little ahead of my story. You have to imagine now, these buildings are popping up after 18, 45, 46, 47. <coughs> Main Street was an active place. You imagine, no, no power shovels, no bulldozers. This was all being dug by hand. The foundations were being put in with either brick or granite. The doorways and the headers were all granite. It was done here in Lincoln County. Some came from Alderboro, some came from out in Bremen. The brick were down a scholar brick. They were made on the Dallas Scholar River. We had one brickyard down at Alvin Piper's in his field where Westview Acres is today. I think there was a total of around 12 or 13 brickyards on the Dallas Scholar River. Another brickyard was across the river where a bright boat yard is today. A lot of those brick are in the Dallas Scholar buildings. The next building here is the W.W. Keene building. And I have his cane. And this is a brick that was made by, by Frank Dodge in the brickyard. And uh, he made it into a salt dish. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my friends wrote down in one year and he stubbed his toe and he looked down and he saw a part of a brick. So he dug it out and there was that brick with the name on it. And he said, Calvin, you should have this. He told me where it was. And that's down on the river road by Mary's Island, where there's a brickyard there. So that was a hardware store. And that, I think there's six different hardware stores that was in there. When I was a boy, it was Wichcombe and French hardware store. And I used to go in there with my father. And we would have a wood stove. And about every three years, you had to change the pipe on it. You had to change the header and had to redo something main stove into an optical one that into a round pipe. I remember my father going upstairs and Mr. Fritch would say, well, you sit down, Harold. 
Watch me put this together. He would get his little rolling machine out. He'd make that little transition from the oval piece to the round piece. Then he'd fit the new stove pipe in. And we'd go home and he'd also put a little new damper in and everything. So if you burn wood, you wanted to keep the stove pipe all nice. Eventually, they went to stainless steel. And my mother had a stainless steel stove pipe coming off the end, you know, as we called it. Did a great job. The next one we get out through the brick building, and that was built by Adna Stetson. Now, Adna Stetson was a tremendous shipbuilder. He built 47 ships here in Dallas Colony. Some of the ships set records that were never beaten again by sail. He was an outstanding shipbuilder, created a lot of wealth. Some of his wealth went in to build in the Lincoln Hall block in 1875. If you walk what we call Elm Street today, you see two or three nice, beautiful brick buildings. He built all those buildings for his sons for money made in the shipbuilding business. And if you go up on Business Route 1 and you come to where the veterinary office is today, that was one of Abner Stetson's first houses. And the old photos would show a widow's watch on top of that building. And he had a shipyard down next to the river. So his wife could take the children up to the widow's watch. And it was a four-sided cubicle looking down where his shipyard was and seeing the ships being built. But at that time, because they had to bring them down the river on extremely high tides to get over the ledges and the low falls. So he knew he had to find a place to build where there was always deep water. So Adam moved his shipyard down to where the congregation of churches today. And behind, uh, well, the new, where the new brick block is built. And where, when I was a boy, it was Thomas E. Gay's grocery store. He had a big, beautiful wall there where ships used to bring up coal and unload them. And the Sacone Vacuum also had a wharf there where they had six oil tanks. I remember those. They was tearing them down in 1947 because the trucks were taking over all the product. So they no longer needed a coastal oil tank to come up and supply the oil down the sky. The next one down, Mary, you want to show it? Well, that's still the Adnestetsa block. Then we get to the block. Today, uh, East Blue Bay Furniture Company is in there and the Puppet Company is in there. And uh, that was a building put together with shipyard money. Tremendous lot of money. Well, this is another one. This is still the Stetson and the Stetson block. Then you move into this walk, like I say, this is the old walk here where the early grocery stores are located, Chapman and Chapman. <coughs> and down, this was built by Metcalf and Stetson again. The library used to be up here at one time. Apartments are here now. Still a good structure building, wooden sidewalks, bus and buggies on Main Street. One thing I'm missing, the big tall chimneys. If you, when I was a boy, they started to lean. The old saying goes, the chimneys will lean towards the sun because the freezing and the chlorine and the water getting into the water to cause the chimneys to lean. So a lot of them have been torn down. Just about three years ago, the chimneys were puffing, were all taken down because the heating systems have changed. You know, don't need to heat these buildings anymore with the chimneys. The only reason they were tall, they wanted to drop. They have a good draft and a wood stove, a good draft and a coal stove. It sold well. Now, I don't want to take all the time, but I'll, I'll continue on. Now, Houston, you've been in some of these buildings here. Yeah. Can you tell some of the architecture that went on? <coughs> most, of, most of it was built uh, in what I call the Empire area. That was in the 1840s. 
Now all the doors, a lot of those buildings are panel doors. Yeah, all the the panel. Usually some from four panels, some from six. Most of them are fours. Mm -hmm. say. And they're made up of hand, usually about two inch material. The outside ones, the inside ones are a little thinner. <clears throat> Now, a lot of the door handles on those, uh, the old type, Bennington doorknobs, right? Uh, well, they were Bennington doorknobs, yes. That's when doorknobs first came in, see. Mm -hmm. When those buildings were set up at that time, see. And Stokes first came in, because they had fireplaces before that, you know. Because a lot of these uh, buildings that were built in that period, they had fireplaces in every room. Can you catch the face of people so they can hear you? So they can see what's going on here? Ah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, a lot of these telecoms had five places that would only eat the walls. So stove stoves came in about 1850. See? Uh, but they had those block stoves that they used to keep the grain trolls for, things like that. So. But a lot of the houses, you see, the house that my great grandfather used to build had five places in every room. sidewalks and take the ashes from all these buildings and sand the sidewalk with the ashes. That's what they so, used to do. You know, yeah. We had good Yankee ingenuity. <laughs> we didn't have to worry about hauling the ashes off across the neighborhoods. A lot of salvation units too. From buildings. Yeah. 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 The glass in your great grandfather's house and the windows would have been imported from Great Britain. When did we start making our own glass? I think during the Revolutionary War. I think they started with the glass, because it tells about some of those early glass factories. But they used poured glass, some of it was poured, you see. And then sometimes they put a little very big disc and flatten it out and then cut that. The only problem there that it wasn't straight, and I don't know how they cut it off. 
windows. I have windows that came from Mars Day House, the original windows. That, that you had to cut the frame to fit the glass because it wasn't flat. I didn't know how to cut that stuff. Without busting it. <laughs> Did the technology change for making glass by the time these buildings were built in 1850? The glass was flatter and bigger. Yeah, well, you see that they poured it. So it laid flat, see. See, because when they blew those discs, it wasn't flat, you see. See, because they blew those great big sheets and then <coughs> and then cut it off of that. It must have been part of the job to flatten that out. So it would be all uh, somewhere near the same thickness. <coughs> and then a lot of times the bullseye pieces that you was too. Oh, like two lives, no one can say. The center piece they cut out, they cut out of the center of it, say. <coughs> and of course all sanctions that they were made by hand then. Sash is what I say. Sash is sack planes to make them, you see. And then all, all double tenon joints. And they were thinner. And one of the, the 18th century ones were thin. They were only about an inch and a quarter thick. And the lens. See? When those sash were, see. The later ones, you get when you get into the turn of the last century, they look to me thicker. Finish our trip down the road, down the street here, Kelvin. You ready to finish our, our trip down the down the okay, street? Okay, we'll be down the road. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. You're welcome. <laughs> First, I want to show you this game. This is W. W. Keen. He's the one. We Keen that built the hardware store. Well, there's six different hardware stores today. So W. W. Keen, 1856. <laughs> he made a lot of his money selling stoves, cast iron stoves, or back stoves and they, different stoves, a pioneer stove. So he probably provided a lot of these stoves in these buildings. He also provided probably the uh, stove pipe and the funnel work and all that stuff. Even the ventilation work he did. And uh, I cherish his pain and I'll eventually give it to the Damascana Historical Society. But this is where it belongs here in Dallas Garden. He was one of the founding fathers here who helped build the new buildings after the fire of 1845, the great supporter of the village of Dallas Garden. What started the fire? Well, according to Harold Kastner's records, it started in one of the sail loft buildings, which set over the water on pilot. And of course, the wind in the afternoon, you live in Dallas Carter, usually comes up the river about two o'clock in the afternoon. Pretty stressful winds, but we're lucky we're getting the sea breeze. So I imagine once I got going, and uh, there was no fire protection, so I guess went under the wall and under all the buildings. Because when I was a boy, I'm going to date back to when we built the parking lot. Even those buildings, the tide came up all the way almost to the highway, Main Street. So we had a, quite a problem taking the sand and putting it under all the buildings before we built the parking lot. Did they have a fire brigade try to put that out? Well, Dallas Carter didn't have much of uh, the fire department. That's why. They, the merchants and the citizens were up in arms. Uh, we didn't become a town and separate until about 1848. So that's when the town of Damascona became incorporated. That was one of the major things. We got to get our own town. We got our own fire protection, police protection. Because no doubt about it, we were playing the lion's share of taxes. What time of year was the fire? It was in the spring. In the spring. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead, Mary. We have one more question here. Is the uh, the parking lot, is that all built on fill? And so the yes. water used to come further up and closer to Main Street? And where the parking lot is today, yeah. it was just one little walk up there. 
where Harry Mod shipyard was. We built destroyers and I mean, excuse me, we built minesweepers and trap sports sail. I think more, built a total of seven ships during World War II. And they tore the shipyard down and the town bought the land and they had two different times we built in the parking lot. The first one we built to the north of that, to the, up towards the east end of the town. And it included behind what we call <coughs> the, the stores today would be Walt's Pharmacy and Rennie's and all that. That's the first part. The second part, we filled the Misery Gulch. That's going to the east, southwest end of the town. That's where the little chip laid there. Misery Gulch took come home apart. So it wasn't filled then. I mean, there, there were buildings on that. That was all mud flats. Mud flats. Yes. And I have pictures showing that uh, a lot of the back houses were built right on the end of the building. The mother nature and the tide took care of all the Calvin, isn't uh, Bruce's barber shop, wasn't that a revenue office out on the dock there? Yes. Just, mm -hmm. when, when, I, when I was a boy, Joe and Mom stuck at Shipyard. Remember when he was there, don't you, Calvin? Well, think about it. Yeah, Joe and Mom had the Shipyard for Harry Ma. And for Harry Ma, he had to see. Yeah, Harry Ma was his uh, foreman. Yeah. And uh, John Moss died in 1934. He had built a total of 47 trawlers, dragons, and three yachts in his lifetime. He was a builder over in Friendship who came here to Damascus, <coughs> set up ship building. Uh, a lot of his record I trace back, his ships went down to Massachusetts. A lot of the fishing industry on um, Cape Cod bought his trawlers and dragons. Very, very. A uh, well respected gentleman who built beautiful ships and uh, very, they all went across off the Grand Banks. They went scalloping up and down off Newfoundland. And he was a well known commercial shipman for dragons, trawlers, and so forth. Now we're in front of what we call the gift. There's a back gap, steps of law. Here is one of the militia groups out from there. I like the <coughs> commander and everything. And here is the old policy gay store, which is now uh, the location of the uh, East Bay Furniture Company. And here's a post office, and that is a location now of pumpkin store. Used to be the five and nine when I was a boy, and uh, that was run by James Alexander and his mother Mabel Alexander. Mabel Alexander's father was a Carter. Mr. Carter built the largest sailing ship ever built in Dallas County. It was the largest vessel. In fact, they said when they set sail to go down and take it to sea, if you went to the day block, you could see the sail almost way down the south coast. The sails stood up so hard. Very interesting. Now we come to this building here. This one, this building was built. It's now the home of Sheepskin River Pottery. When I was a boy, this was Nash Telephone Company office. This is Nash at a dress shop here. This is Nash. It's where you paid your telephone bills. Uh, up here on the third floor, the Knights of Sapithia and uh, had their hall. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a beautiful picture of the girls of Isis and Pythias with their little flower girls having one of their installation of offices. And the little flower girls, and they are grandmothers. So many of them called me up the other day, said, oh, I remember that, now I'm the grandmother. <laughs> so you can see, uh, as I say, if you get a good old picture and catch it and part of history in a certain time period of our lifestyle, and right next door, of course, was the uh, filling station. We're going back to the Stetson McCraft building, and there was a grocery store there with the old wooden sidewalks, a horse and buggy, relaxing store on their own front. They always dressed up, the store owners, they always had their little 
white vests on and so forth. I like this one here with a man with his beard. Typical, typical period when you get up in the Civil War. Seems like a lot of the Civil War veterans, people at that time had beautiful snow white beards. Uh, well, I have a photo which shows that and tells an old newspaper clipping of who each and every one of the gentlemen were. Now we're going down Main Street, just beyond the Kobe and Gales gas station <laughs> today. This was a building set, set right there where they are located. And they sold art and maps and different things. Later that building was torn down, but the front of it was left. And they built an addition on the back end of it, and it became what they call the Newcastle Garage. And the car garage, they sold the Chevrolets and they sold Dodge vehicles there. And 1932, on a cold, cold day, and just had a big snowstorm. And there's a newspaper clipping, like I said, there was about 12 to 18 inches of snow on all the roofs when that building burned. It burned up something like 23 cars and trucks in that building. And the Nash Telephone Company lost a truck in there. Uh, one of the big fruit dealers in town lost his vehicle. I have some pictures of the vehicles all burned up completely inside. That was a part of history of getting caught on film. And he gave the credit for the other town not catching fire with all the snow on top of the roofs. Then we come down the next building, of course, it's a wooden building. That was torn down. That was the home of Cloverdale. I don't think you people remember Cloverdale? Very. Well, Cloverdale was bought out by the first national company. So a lot of their products used to say Cloverdale. I have a beautiful soda bottle which says Cloverdale Ginger Ale. And that was First National Company. And when they moved from there, they moved across the street where Chapman and Chapman Insurance today. So that was the second First National store in town. Then in 1948, they moved up the street where R.H. Reddy is today, the big department store. So First National had three different stores in Dallas College. Then we come here to the <coughs> Stetson store. And when that went out of business, the A and P took it over. So when the A and P saw that First National moved into a new a building across the street, they also took over the building where I reached his first department store is today, and that was the A and P store. Then you come to the Masonic Law. Well, this is the old JL Clifford Hardware Store. That was back up where well, the uh, Keen Hardware Store was. I love it. They sold wooden shovels or wooden handles, croquet sets, all kinds of pottery, some beautiful ads, and if you would got your magnifying glass out. That's what I like about a real nice photograph. It's worth a thousand words. You get a magnifying glass out. I write an article, and I mention all these things. Some people say, what are you imagining things? Just to make this story interesting. Now I said, come on up. But sometime we'll have a cup of coffee down in the Walt's Pharmacy, and I'll bring some of these pictures you can actually see what was going on. I simply love the ads in some of these, especially First National Store and the A&P, the price of their goods back in the 40s. It was very interesting. And when was that picture taken? That well, that was taken about 1930. 30. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember this. So. Yeah. Well, this goes back here to where the Newcastle, uh, well, they call it the Mouth Garage. That's the location of, of Kobe and Neal's gas station today. Mm -hmm. This is an alleyway, so you drive your trucks and cars in there. And out back, it was a big flat building. And that was one I showed you of a two story brick building with a facade on the front. This is the facade on the front and they left. And they added on the back of that. So that was the building that burned in 1934. And there it is there today. And it was has been torn down. There it is, the old Press National Store. Can you remember that? Yeah, I, I 
I remember the last time I was at that little store. You remember Cliff Gate working there? I don't remember Cliff Gate, but I know the Fest National store and where it was. Okay. Yeah. Now, Houston and I were friends of Kermit Clark. And Kermit Clark, he would tell us some stories. So when he was a young boy, he said he worked in the store there, which was a Cloverdale store. And the second store down was A.M.P. So, Mr. Hilton used to go out on the back of the A.M.P. and dump the small vegetables overboard. Well, Cliff would be doing the same thing. Instead of dumping them overboard, they'd be throwing each other. Those <laughs> <laughs> tomatoes, they'd haul a chali aisle and throw them. So, uh, I wrote down a lot of this stuff. He used to tell me, he said, you know, if you ever did a chance, tell the people what actually went on when we worked at these stores. We had a lot of fun. Nobody got hurt. And it was just part of history. And we got rid of our energy before we came back in the store waiting on somebody. <laughs> now this is taken back and uh, 1890 or so. And this is looking down Main Street towards the bridge in a big snow cell. Beautiful tall chimneys. Dormants are no more. There we go. That, that store was right there. That was the Dallas County Service store. That was Wade King's drug store. Next one is Adam Stetson. Next one is Stetson Metcalf Mall. Now we come to the Masonic Mall. Beautiful building. Like I said, when we built the parking lot, we had to do some work. Now this set up Great granite blocks. Can you imagine digging that out behind, setting that granite work of this big building. And all the granite headers all across there, the granite posts, all the headers, the window sills are granite. And there's a Masonic emblem right there. Now there's dormers up here. It's all been converted into apartments. Down below there's a couple of stores. One is the uh, art shop. The other is the three fish, two fishes store. This is another view of the Masonic Club with the old cars coming in the thing about 1925. Everybody carried a spare tire. But you notice they didn't have a spare rim. So when they changed tires, they put the rim back on, pumped it up by hand to the end of the tube. Beautiful big headlights on the car. Some of those headlights probably measure almost 18 inches in diameter. Big chimneys here again, which have been taken down. Just back on the. Okay, this is looking up Main Street. This used to be the Riverview Restaurant in honor of the boy. It's now. Star's Jewelry Store. The old kerosene light that had, hangs off the front of Metcalf's livery stable. My grandfather worked in that livery stable before he went into the Spanish-American War. What they're doing here is testing the new water system in Dallas Scott. You can see the holes in the water going out there. There again, we had all those tall chimneys. 1897? Yeah, and the date is 1897. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our history rolls by. Is there a little more up there? No, no, go back to the beginning. Let uh, Houston Duke get his mill. What can you remember about that history? About what's that? Masonic Mall. I, I never was in the building myself. I remember when it was built over. But I never was in it to know how it was finished or what it looked like inside. I remember Mr. Lindsay, he had his oh, 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 yeah. 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 He was the one who took these pictures of the storm was here. And he was a full photographer at Damas at the time I was born. And in the 1930s. I think he died in the 30s, I think. Now, really, George Crowell. You remember him, the lawyer? Oh, yes. And I know where they lived, up on the, the part of the church, I think. 
He was a fiery little devil, wasn't he? <laughs> he would always have a great debate at town meeting when I read the records. There's always two characters in a town meeting. One's going to help build the other. You said you want to uh, talk a little bit about the hatch uh, mill that you've got, the, the sawmill that you've got there? Well, the hatch sawmill stood down by the, uh, on the road to Round Pond, while you go by the, uh, the townhouse in, in Bristol. And you take the left there on the right hand side of it. And this is the entrance to uh, Boyd's Pond. And the dam's still there. This building was standing when I was born. And when the, the, uh, when the Lindsay took these pictures, it was unusual. Uh, usually they didn't take pictures of the inside of them. This shows the up and down sawmill rig it was in that building, see? It was built by Aaron Blaney, let us say, about here, that was about 1825. And it always fascinated me that building. And I went down there and took, uh, and, uh, and took measurements of it, which I have at home. <clears throat> it fell down in the 1930s when I was, uh, when I was yes. The up and down sawmill is when um, the saw marks well, the, the, oh, yes. come in on each end. And what yeah, it's you can see the saw marks in the woods. See. Mm -hmm. Before see, circulars. Yeah. Uh, the circular saw, you see circular marks, but now I'm reading, you see the up and down sawmill marks, you see. Mm -hmm. And every time that went up and down and saw that it made a difference what you was cutting. Well, you were cutting those big logs, big hollywood logs while you were doing a saw them. Neat and inch, see. But when you got into pine, about a quarter, that's what most of those were set. And it was set looks every time in that mill where that went up and down, it set that carriage hit, see. You cut the those off, and you had to adjust that. It was an adjustment, and I said you could adjust it because it was a cut. Okay. <clears throat> but it was interesting because this this does have those, uh, have those uh, showing the inside of the building, which they didn't usually take the inside of those buildings. See. Okay, our tape is running out. So, uh, Mr. thank you very much. To both Calvin and Houston for coming, and to all of you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.